Hello DEFCON, welcome to our talk, DNS section. Um, today will be an interesting talk about uh, DNS and the workings of the internet and cryptography. So, what this talk is about is about a Nemo privacy breach in the largest French cloud provider, which is also the first practical attack on NSEC, DNS sec zone walking. And finally, it's a cautionary tale about the use of hash functions. Why this matters is because DNS is everywhere. It's part of the internet. Uh, it's heavily used, it's very important, and there are tons of potentially very valuable, interesting data all over the place. The other reason why it matters is that zone walking has not been demonstrated in the wild to this extent before, and it's the first time that we actually recover very valuable, interesting data from it. Who we are? Well, this is Adrien. Hello. And I'm Rémi. We are from École Normale Supérieure, PSL University in Paris, France, in the beautiful place itself. And this is not the first time that we talk at DEFCON. Uh, this has been done in collaboration with Amory Barral and David Nakash. So without further ado, let's start with the first part of our talk. So to understand uh, DNS uh, is very important to understand our talk. We're going to start with that. The basic question that you ask with DNS is who is behind a website, uh, such as skytalk-fits.com, for instance. So DNS, the domain name system, is a system to name remote resources, to give you access to them, and it does that by holding a distributed database, uh, a system that contains record resources and domain names, and that allows resolvers to figure out the translation between a domain name and an IP address. The DNS tree itself is subdivided into subtrees that are called zones and that are administrated by different people, different entities, whose role it is to keep it up to date. So when you want to, say, build a website, create a new website, well, you actually need to go through several steps. Once you have a, a device and you have a server and you have a website running on it, you need to add your device, your, your IP address, to a DNS server. And to do that, you call a registrar and you run a DNS server that advertises your IP uh, in connection to the domain name that you are interested in. Too. And you have to maintain all of this, of course. Most people do not want to go to such trouble to get their website running, and therefore they just pay someone to do the job for them. Um, including getting all this working together. This is the spirit behind cloud hosting, which does provide the device, the hosting, the maintenance, and also the DNS registration and DNS uh, publication. And this is the main thing we are going to talk about. Our target today is uh, OVH Cloud. They are the largest uh, French cloud provider by far and second in Europe. And they sell all kind of uh, cloud related services. Uh, in particular, they do sell domain names. And uh, the basic plan for domain names include email redirects. Uh, namely, it means you do not get a full email account, but you can redirect uh, like contact at your OVH cloud domain to your usual Gmail account. And uh, as a side note, they do host uh, Wikileaks since uh, 2010. So uh, let's create an email redirect on the example domain here, dnssection.ovh, which we have just bought for the occasion. So in the admin panel, we just uh, add a redirect from test at dnssection.ovh to target at yopmail.com and click confirm. And if we go look at the DNS zone, which we can also find in the admin panel, then we realize there is a new DNS record in there. If we zoom on this, 
then you can see that uh, for test at dnssection.ovh and you have a txt record with a target email so target at yopel.com so this means that uh, anyone uh, in the world can just query uh, test at dnssection.ovh and get the target of your email redirect uh, obviously it's not uh, easy to get the whole database because you cannot ask the DNS server for so the whole list of uh, subdomains of at .dnssection.ovh So why, why does it matter? Why do we care? Well, assume for a moment that we do manage to find a way to access this redirection database. Uh, it does contain a lot of interesting information. It's actually essentially client information for the users of this cloud hosting service. Uh, it includes well, emails, of course, but also names and uh, potentially more information, billing information, for instance. Which with, with which we can be creative. We can actually start wondering, okay, what can we do with this information? Well, we can perhaps spam, we can, we can try password dumps, we can perform social engineering on the basis of this information. We can perhaps find interesting um, information on the businesses that they hold and so forth. So there's really a lot of ideas about what we can do with this information and we will show you that in the latest part of this talk. Um, so, well, let's try the naive way to do brute force to recover all the information using just a DNS query directly on the, on the hosts that we are interested in. So the way we would do that is we get a list of OVH cloud handled domains. Uh, we select those that we are most interested in, get a sublist, and we DNS query these domains works rather well for the domains that are hosted by OVH and in doing so we have two ways essentially to get an interesting redirect email either we look for the public email addresses the ones that are displayed on the website uh, and we try to see whether they redirect to something interesting this is one way the other way is we don't really know what the real address is or whether they are redirects to begin with so we well we try addresses we think are likely to exist such as abuse at the domain admin at contact at uh, the domain and in doing so we if we get a response uh, we get not only the existence of this particular email address that we just guessed but also the corresponding target uh, email redirect which does not appear either on the website or in that case uh, elsewhere. Of course, if you just try to do this, you're going to run into trouble because it's very likely that it is not stealthy to just query massively uh, random DNS um, servers with random email addresses. So in practice, if you want to do this, you better be clever and avoid rate limiting by using several clients. But just for the sake of demonstrations, uh, here we're gonna do this from a single host using very simple low-tech devices, including uh, Bash and Dig and just the file system. So really, we just run a first script that queries the DNS server to get a lot of interesting information about the domains and then we dig the txt record, the one that contains the redirect in our case. So, well, there's a demo for that. Okay, so let's look at this in action. You have here the, the bash script we just showed you. And we are going to run this very script right now. It will show addresses, we just blurred them for privacy reasons. So on the left, you have the addresses that we query, and we recover the TXT record on the right with the redirection email. This, this video is real time, so it shows you that this is quite fast, in fact, quite efficient. 
and we do this from a single host here but of course you can parallelize this effort by calling several ad addresses at the same time so what do we get it, it does work uh, it does work we do get information so if we if we consider a subset of about 14 14,000 potentially vulnerable domains in the FR TLD uh, what we get is about 15,000 email redirects of which about 10,000 unique email addresses something we didn't have before so this is extremely interesting but you might say well uh, we used public emails or easily guessable emails and we found private redi redirection emails so well perhaps I mean it's interesting but but what are we not seeing what are we missing from the picture and that's where DNS section comes into play really so what we are going to do is we are going to use DNS sec DNS sec is it, in itself a very interesting topic and a very large one if we want to go into details we might as well do a talk entirely on the topic and perhaps even s several talks so very short summary what you should know about it is that DNS itself is insecure if you use it like it just like like this so you need extensions which are provided for most of them by DNSSEC every modern good implementation of a DNS server does have support for DNSSEC and so do resolvers essentially what DNSSEC does is it provides a root of trust and a tree derivation scheme that use public key cryptography digital signatures to ensure authenticity so you know that you are really talking to the server you think you are talking to and that the information provided there is at least uh, the one that it commits to to sending uh, so it requires cryptographic elements and it requires uh, sometimes some lock picking skills as perhaps the recent enough incident depicted here shows if you know what I'm talking about if not look into what happens in a key rollover session uh, of DNSSEC so we can look at this uh, we can we can look at the information sent to us by a DNSSEC compatible server one tool that we can use to recover information about DNSSEC is DNSVs it is available in your favorite browser at dnsviz.net. So here we apply it to dnssection.ovh, which is the website we use for demonstration purposes during this talk. It has been slowed down so I can comment on it. It is actually much faster than this. It queries all the interesting information about the DNS records here and we can see the full chain of trust for the domain. So, in particular, we can see all the cryptographic information, the algorithm in use, and we can also see some of the common subrecords that appear in the DNS zone. SOA, TXT, MX, NS and A records. You can also see which algorithm have been used. In this particular case, dnssection.ovh uses dnssec with algorithm 8, RSA plus SHA 266 with NSEC 3. And you can go up to the OVH and above zones and see how things are derivated from the root of trust. Here, you can see dot .ovh switching from algorithm 8 to algorithm 13, one of the 2020 goals for AFNIC. DNSVs also checks for errors. Try it on defcon.org, you will be surprised. Unless, of course, the Gund have watched our talk in advance and have already fixed it.
let us dive in a fundamental obstacle of uh, GNS stack. So uh, issue with negative responses. For positive responses, it's quite easy. If you want to authenticate that the record example.com is at IP 1.2.3.4 is exist, then it's quite easy. You just affix your signature to it. But if you want to authenticate that there is no record for bad.example.com, this is much trickier. You obviously cannot put every negative possibility signing in the zone. This is where NSEC comes to the rescue. Uh, NSEC is much more trickier and complicated than uh, what I'm going to explain here, but all you need to understand is uh, the principle depicted uh, in this slide. So basically, NSEC signs uh, intervals where there is no domain. For example, it could sign there is no domain between apple.example.com and carrot.example.com in lexicographical order, and therefore, it means that bad.example.com cannot exist uh, because B is between A and C. Uh, it does create a big issue and, uh, so that you can now enumerate all records uh, in the DNS zone. How to do that is quite easy. Just pick a random name, for example, fgfrd.example.com and query the DNS server for it. It will and obviously fgrd does not exist, it's a random name, so it will answer the interval uh, associated with uh, it. And so here it tells you that there is nothing between carrot.example.com and good.example.com. Uh, very good, we have just found two subdomains of example.com. We just repeat with a successor of good, here good a, get another name, another interval, and loop until we found every positive uh, record in the zone. So it means that uh, it is uh, trivially uh, doable for an attacker to uh, get the whole DNS zone of an NSEC uh, enabled domain. So now you might be thinking, okay, that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna use NSEC zone walking. No, that's not what we're gonna do. Um, because NSEC, NSEC, NSEC zone walking doesn't work, doesn't work anymore in the real world for the simple reason that no one uses NSEC at all anymore. Yes, you can be sad about this. So this, this is not what we're going to do. We're going to do something more clever, uh, although not very different. So that's why we talked about it. Um, what we're going to do is zone walking with NSEC 3. NSEC 3 has been designed and implemented and deployed for the very reason of providing resistance against zone enumeration the way we just described for NSEC. So it's a patch on NSEC. In a nutshell what it does is instead of having the records in plain text they hash them using several repetition of the SHA-1 algorithm usually with sort or without sort. So the idea is it should hide the contents of the uh, DNS records uh, and, and assuming you cannot do anything with hash values, well, you don't get access to them, you, you cannot enumerate. Truth is you can still dump the hash itself, so you, we can still do zone walking, we can still extract the hashes, it still kind of works. And NSEC3 is really what is deployed today in, in the real world. So that's what we are going to attack. As Remy just explained, the assumption behind NSEC3 is that reversing even partially the hash is difficult. Well, in practice, uh, it turns out it's not really true. Uh, you've probably heard about uh, many people trying to break hashes, especially for passwords and uh, breaking hashes is even like basically how you mine Bitcoin. So uh, I think I hearing uh, loves in the Bitcoin mining farm when uh, he they, uh, when they hear that SH1 cannot be referred. So uh, in practice for uh, GNSSEC, you can find uh, off the shelf readily available tools to crack the NSEC free hashes. However, to the best of uh, our knowledge, it has uh, never been used to dig valuable data. Uh, they only use that for the 
same demo, which is uh, finding the list of uh, subdomains of .com or .org, but most of the time the list of valuable domains is uh, better found using Google or your favorite search engine. Okay, so let's show you the NSEC free Volker tool, which is used to get the hashes from the domain zone. This is actually a collection of scripts. Here we call the script collect of NSEC free Volker on our DNS section .ovh domain. It starts by getting the NSEC free parameters which are the salt and the number of SHA1 iteration. Then it is going to crawl through it and try random domains to find the intervals as we have explained in the previous slides. This video has been slowed down a lot. In practice, with a good network, this is actually really fast. You even get a progress bar from the tool. Here, the zone is quite small, so we get all the hashes very quickly. If you want to dump a TLD zone, I mean a top level domain zone, such as .org, then it takes much, much more time. Another tool, NSEC Free Map, also exists and has advanced features such as parallel queries and automatic conversion for Hashcat and John the Reaper. Unfortunately, it has been written in Python 2, which is in the process of going extinct. So, use whichever tool you feel more comfortable with. Well, so we have just dumped uh, all the hashes of uh, dnssection.ovh. What do we do now? Well, uh, we bring out the GPU rig. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole data center. We only have a nice Tesla P100. If you know nothing about GPUs, let's just say this is not a potato GPU. So most of you have heard about uh, Hashcat before. This is the standard tool to break hashes. So uh, let us just feed the output of uh, NSEC3 to Hashcat and try different type, kind of attacks, such as dictionary attacks and brute force attacks. Here, we show you a little demo of Hashcat. In this case, this is a simple brute force of all lowercase alphanumeric emails of exactly five characters, as you can see on the command line. First, Hashcat displays some information about the GPU and compiles the OpenCL NSEC free kernel tailored for your GPU. Then, it starts the hash cracking process. In this case, we only run it on a small subset of our findings. The video has been speed up to avoid audience boredom. You can see a few hashes being reversed on the screen. Again, we blurred the result for privacy reasons. As a side note, we have found a bug in Hashcat. Dots were not handled correctly. Many emails contain dots in the left part, so this proved to be a serious concern for us. We made a dirty fix for ourselves, and the Hashcat team has since fixed it properly. Thanks a lot to them. Let us consider uh, about 16,000 interesting GenXSec hashed record. Well, uh, using our GPU, we were able to unhash as much as 88% of them, so uh, quite a good result. Let's uh, see a little breakdown of uh, our results. So in three quarters of the cases, we were able to reverse the hash and we did find an interesting email redirection. 
In 14%, we did reverse the hash, but it was something else, such as an FPF record. And in the remaining 12%, well, we were not able to unhash thing. By God's thing, uh, the remaining one are mostly domain key records, which are not discriminable for uh, email redirections. A little disclaimer, we are not here to dox people, so uh, obviously all people names and domain names in the following example have been modified. Let's look at a few statistics. So first, we can uh, just uh, classify the target of the redirection uh, by the email providers I use. I think you can guess uh, which email provider is used by most webmasters, and this is obviously gmail.com. And then, uh, if you look uh, at the left part of the email, well, uh, it does leak the name of the people quite often, because, well, uh, most emails are uh, your name at something uh, dot your country. So uh, it happens that in practice, the name of the person is, uh, is found in the email in about half the time. However, this doesn't mean uh, that we found some private information uh, on some website. Uh, people happily say that they do run the website. So we uh, try to find out how often we could not find the name in the target of the redirection on the website. Well, this is in about two-thirds of the time. So, in two-thirds of the time, when we have a name in the target of a redirect, then this was not something we could have easily found on the website. So, we have leaked some private information. A little uh, more complicated is uh, how often this email would not appear in a Google search. And in practice, this is about half uh, of the time. So. Uh, this means that there are a lot of emails that are not publicly available and we did, again, find a lot of private info using them. Uh, last thing uh, is, uh, was a little more uh, difficult to uh, identify and this is about a business connection, conflict of, of interest or fake competitors. And uh, using uh, the redirection we found, well, we were able to find such things in about one quarter of the cases. A little homework for you that we have not tried is uh, run the found emails through the haven't been pwned database and find how many of them do have an entry in it. What if, it, if we try to dox uh, scam an adult website? Well, first, please don't tell my wife about it. Well, uh, we did try to find uh, some names or some business connection, but they are very clever and it's actually a fail. Their email never disclosed their name. But we still have the email, so who's the scammer and who's the scamming? Anything more serious? Well, we did find some uh, famous people emails, that are like politicians and uh, showbiz people, we, which have their own uh, Wikipedia page. We also found a few emails of uh, activists and on a much lighter note, uh, we did find a lawyer website with a redirect to, guess what, mylittlepony.hisbirthdate at gmail.com. And also uh, we found 50 people who uh, had added uh, redirects for the no reply at other domain. Like, why would it do that? A uh, little caveat, uh, this is actually some manual analysis. Uh, we went through hundreds of websites, uh, fishing for uh, the names and the emails. So typically this means going through the contact page, go go googling the name, googling the emails, and dealing with obscene stuff such as Adobe Flash website, uh, which are like really difficult to navigate through. So this is all but best effort, and we might have missed some public data. So, okay, we find a lot of interesting information. Some of it apparently does not appear either on the website or on in Google. Uh, and very likely, well, it's information that was not meant to be made public. So we thought it was an interesting issue. We tried to bring it up to OVH Cloud. 
So we called your hotline and we're going to tell you about the disclosure process. So we called the hotline and we said, OK, we think we have a, a problem uh, with your handling of private data. They say, send an email to abuse at. OK, so we write the email and we include the technical details, some of which uh, we just shared with you right now. And uh, we never got a reply. So, well, we were, a bit, we were a bit puzzled. Perhaps we did not understand what they meant by send an email. So uh, we called them again. And calling them again, they say, yes, do send an email to abuse that. Uh, you did the right thing, just do it again. Perhaps they missed it. So, okay, well, we write a second email. And um, we never got a reply. So at that point, um, what we tried is to contact people working there try to ping the right person and uh, to try and get them to forward our email internally to the, to the right people. Um, well, to this day, we are still waiting for a response. So, OVH, if you are looking at us, we tried. Okay, so well, if you want to fix it, what, what should you do if you do not want to be uh, targeted by the kind of enumeration and uh, privacy disclosure that we just described? turns out that this has been a goal of NSEC for many years now. This, is, this was the reason why NSEC 3 was proposed, and obviously NSEC 3 failed. Um, but the, the, the real, the correct answer to this is use public key cryptography. It's been described uh, in, in two RFCs how to do this with the NSEC in a way that's compatible with the NSEC. And there are two leading implementations of this idea. One is NSEC 5, which is already six years old now, um, and the other is to use NSEC 3 but replace the hash by a uh, public key uh, signature, a digital signature. The problem is NSEC 5 uh, was met with skepticism in the first draft and the draft has not been finalized and it has not been standardized and it brings latency into the game. Uh, but most importantly, NSEC has a bad track record. This is already the fifth iteration of it, and you have not heard of NSEC 2 or NSEC 4 in this talk, and you might wonder why. Well, perhaps they never got to see the light for good reasons. The alternative is NSEC 3, NSEC 3 with digital signatures. And today that means um, ECDSA, Algorithm 13 in the DNS, SEC uh, documentation, um, mainly because it is the only one that can be used in this list, um, because it signs fast and the signatures are small enough that it is actually practical to use. But it's on a fixed curve with a fixed hash function, and it's a bit of an old algorithm, to be honest, which makes, amongst other issues, uh, resolvers bed, carry the burden. The fact that resolvers now have to perform signature verification, which is actually quite slow. It also requires very careful implementation and handling of algorithms and keys because ECDSA is famously brittle. Uh, and experience in the matter shows that DNS servers are, well, historically bad at it. Um, we gave you a reference on the slide that you can look into about the handling of RSA keys in the past. Remy has just explained you how to fix DNSSEC. But most people do not want to handle their DNS zone by themselves and thus use cloud hosting. So, assume for a second that you are an OVH loss customer and you are using the redirection features. How can you protect yourself right now? Well, there are two different things to protect. First, the target of the email redirection. An easy way to hide the real target email is to use double redirects. Let me explain. First, redirect test at dnssection.ovh to test dot dns section at gmail.com in the OVH Cloud admin panel. Then, in your Gmail interface, redirect test dot dns section at gmail.com 
to your personal email address. An attacker will only be able to see the first redirect and thus will not learn anything useful. Second, you want to protect your domain email list. This is actually quite trickier. What about disabling DNSSEC entirely? Well, there is a reason DNSSEC exists and dropping the security properties of DNSSEC might not be worth it. Or you may also have services for which DNSSEC queues is a must. Another possibility to protect the list would be to use long and unpredictable emails so the hash is almost impossible to reverse. For online websites, with this works quite well, the web server does not care much. However, a long and non-human friendly email is not going to make a good first impression on your business card. If your domain email list is especially sensitive, the best way out is probably to stop using vulnerable OVH load redirection for now. Upgrade to an OVH load plan with real email addresses. So while well, that brings us to a conclusion for this talk, which will be rather fast because you heard most of what we had today to say already. The lesson to remember, do not store private information in your DNS zone if you do not have to. This is likely to leak unless, well, countermeasures are widely de deployed. Uh, DNSSEC and SEC3 attacks exist. They are practical and they can reveal information that was not obtained in any other way that we know of. So try to push your local representative for a DNS server to adopt modern countermeasures against zone enumeration. And SEC5 is not yet final. Try to push for it. And adoption of ECDSA as a signature for zone enumeration is also uh, on the way but you know it's, it's it's taking time so try and get there that's all we had to say and uh, do have a look at the proof of concept website that we put up for you to play with uh, thank you again have a great day and try this at home um, very carefully of course bye bye